Monster House presents. It's actually quite unlike anything we've ever seen before. A giant hairy creature, part ape, part man. In Loch Ness, a 24-mile-long bottomless lake in the highlands of Scotland, it's a creature known as the Loch Ness Monster. Monster Talk. Welcome to Monster Talk, the science show about monsters. I'm Blake Smith. And I'm Karen Stolzner. Hey there again, Monster Talkers. As I record this, it's Labor Day weekend 2024, and I'll be giving a talk today on my silver bullet and werewolf research at the Skeptic Track at DragonCon. And hopefully snagging some fun interviews throughout the weekend. In the meantime, Let's continue my conversation with screenwriter and now podcaster Richard Haddam about his new show, Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf. As we'll say in this discussion, this is a reach across the aisles kind of chat because Richard certainly doesn't self-identify as a skeptic, but we're both fascinated by the same weird stuff that hopefully you also care about. I really think it's important to talk to all kinds of people. You don't have to be convinced by, and I'm air quoting here, the other side, In order to have meaningful and informative conversations, you could just be two people talking about big ideas and sharing common curiosity. I think it's useful and fun, and I hope you find it to be the same. We will be picking up this conversation from part one, already in progress, and if you missed part one, you should probably catch that first. Oh, and the language in this got a little rowdy, and so I think I've beeped everything, but just to be safe, I've slapped an explicit tag in case you're in a situation where you need to be concerned about such things. Hopefully didn't miss any, but there's your warning. Monster dog. Like when I was in the Navy, I had so many friends who were gay and lesbian, but they couldn't say it. And we hardly ever talked about it. But, you know, you, they could lose their jobs. They could get kicked out of the Navy. It could be dishonorable discharge. It was like there was serious consequences to being true to yourself. And that right. sucks. And so I always, when I learned about D. Scott Rogo, I was like, I, I felt this weird affinity from him, you know, for like living a secret life, you know, and like being interested well, in this stuff. So, yeah, I just felt a strong connection, even though we were on the opposite side of the belief spectrum, you know. I totally get what you're saying. And, and I've, and that notion has occurred to me also okay. that, that there's the, the outsider feeling. Now I'm, you know, you and I are straight, white, males in the american culture of the you know 21st century so we're living a very distinct life yeah um and and so so while i i see what you're saying about that sort of like oh yeah i kind of know what that feels like to feel like i can't really be my authentic self in all situations yeah and when and we were growing up at a time when the sort of like most glaring example of that would have been, oh, gay people who are part of our culture, but keep this one aspect hidden. What's really cool about right now and the, you know, podcasts and the internet is that a lot of people who feel outside the mainstream for all kinds of reasons are able to kind of find each other and, and not, sort of nodding go, oh. vigorously for our listeners. I'm nodding vigorously. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, he, is, he is, I swear to God. <laughs> well, what it does, though, is in the best possible sense, it makes you go, oh, okay, but if I feel weird and marginal because of my interest in a particular subject, I can now understand and sympathize with other people who feel marginalized for other, m- maybe much more foundational reasons that are that that actually do impact their lives and the way they are allowed to even conduct their lives. And it's certainly what it's done for me. It's, it's almost like, yeah, please tell me how you're an outsider in whatever way. And we will then have something we share, even if you're an outsider, because you like some weird, you know, sport or stamp collecting or whatever. It's like, yeah, that's the thing. And I talk about it a lot next season, but it's kind of, it's the joy and the tragedy of never joining the group, you know? Yeah. And, 
you're you're never going to be the one in the stands waving a flag for your football team, you know, or at least I wasn't. I I was like, I don't get it. I don't really get how people get excited by going, hey, I identify with this larger thing. And I was like, well, I don't. But of course, for me, it was sour grapes because I'd, I'd never been welcome in the larger group. Yeah. Because I wasn't an athlete, you know, and I wasn't whatever. So it's like, oh, the things I care about, no one else does. And that's not, you know, and it's so funny because, again, in the 70s, it's like, no, you're special, free to be you and me. And whatever makes you different makes you special. Yay, Earth but, Day. What? <laughs> right. And I, and I and God bless them for saying that and for making the the outsider kids try to feel OK. But the fact of the matter is, for the majority of our lives, being different isn't helpful. And it doesn't make your life easier. It makes your life more difficult. It's actually far easier to just be, I'm a straight white guy who loves the team. The team, yeah. And and, and I don't have the sports gene. Exactly. Whatever that is that makes people love sports, I don't have it. Yeah. And that is so awkward because I'm really good. I'm really good on team trivia, but not on sports. And and I I don't feel like, and I'm not talking about like the, the, uh, oh, there's one category I need to work on. I mean, no, I feel disconnected from most of society because most people do love sports, you know? Okay. Yeah. So, so, okay. Now you're me. Yeah. (laughs) You know, you finally are working in Hollywood as a TV writer. All TV writers feel like outsiders, even within Hollywood. And now I'm sitting, I find myself throughout my career, I'll be sitting with a group of writers and then one of them will start talking sports and then the others suddenly are all talking sports. And so the Whoa, that's so weird. <laughs> just keeps getting smaller. And I'm like, oh my God, even among my people, I'm still ostracized yeah. because, and, and you know, I don't have a lot of regrets in life, but, but one of them in a weird way is I almost wish I had been born with an interest in sports. Cause if you have that as a guy, you can talk to anybody. Yes. Yeah. Instantly. Absolutely. You know, and I just never had that. And I'm like, yeah. And, and again, at a certain point, I just had to embrace all that stuff. And, and it's like, Hey, you know what? I also don't like opera and I also don't care. I mean, there's a lot of things that I'm not into, but the sports one is like, yeah, that's, that's when you're a guy that, that, Cuts you out of yeah. so many. It makes you an outsider. It absolutely does. Yeah. And but isn't so much of the paranormal stuff about being an outsider. In fact, if you, um, I, it. Let me tell you something. When I ran into podcasting, I think it was probably around two thousand seven, and uh, and I thought, oh, one of the first shows I found was Skepticality, which uh, was done here in Atlanta. Uh, and I started listening to that, the skeptics guide to the universe. And I was like, Oh, I'm an it guy. I could totally do this. Like, like the technological side of this is completely, you know, uh, clear to me. I, I, I totally see how to do this, but I didn't know, even though I come from a background of writing and I had some experience with radio and, and broadcasting with the, with the Navy, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do a show about. And then I ran into Karen at a, uh, at Dragon Con in 2008. And we all were sitting around talking about monsters and like, oh, this could be the thing. I kept thinking podcasting was something I'd be interested in. This could be the thing. We spent about a year working on it, whatever. Um, but that whole community, like that whole sense of finding your tribe, that was new to me. I, I've always been the weirdo, the outsider, the, the oddball. You know, and so even though I'm comfortable talking to almost anybody about anything, I don't always feel a part of the group. And so suddenly I found this group of people through online uh, podcasting, online communities. And I was like, this is my tribe. This is awesome. I could really thrive here. I pe- These people will know what I'm talking about. And then I discovered, no, not really, because it turns out that in, in the skeptic world, most of them are more interested in talking about religion being dumb uh and there there is right. no god this is not or alt med uh homeopathy and reiki and acupuncture that's which is very serious oh, right. stuff you know and only a, a, a subset was interested in the paranormal and i'm like well, i don't know why because 
that's where the big stuff is. That's where people care. I mean, yeah, just like true crime, people there's like a sort of dirty kind of secretive, like I'm into ghosts, I'm into monsters aspect to it. But those are the big questions. These are the big questions. Are we alone in the universe? Do we continue after we die? Are there monsters out there that disprove the scientific evolutionary perspective? Like, are all the big well, paradigms bullshit? You know, like, you know, yeah. those are big questions. Why are we not asking those questions? You know, why are we not seriously looking into this? And why do so many people believe in this stuff if it's not real? You know, th these are really serious questions. Well, I mean, and that leads to books entitled Why Do People Believe Weird Things? And, you know, why, you know, why do people believe bullshit or whatever? But it, it's like there's 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 a group think even there there is a team and you want to be on the team and there are team leaders that are that are well respected and and it's also a fairly unassailable uh point of view once you're in that group you're fairly unassailable it it it, it you're not going to get a lot of argument when when you say um all, all, all that exists in our world is what you can, you know, experience with yeah. your five senses. And and if any of this other stuff existed, we'd already know it and we don't. So next question. And now let's get to the good stuff of how are religious people ruining the, <laughs> the, the, the forward progress of our lives, which which is an argument even I can, you know, get behind and I can, you know, get on board with that. There's what? a lot of. Laws yeah. that are being made based on a religion I don't believe in. So, yeah, on in, in that in that regard, the skeptics and I are on the same side. But um, it, it's easy well, it's, to, it, it's easy to, to focus on those downsides. But you know, there's that sense of community that you get at a church. You do not get at skeptics in the pub. You know, it's it's just not the <laughs> same. You know, <laughs> and where are the potlucks, my friends? Where are the potlucks? That's what I'm asking. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I was going to say because I've you know. You talk about D. Scott Rogo and that he um, that he's gay, and it's something I've thought about a lot. It's like just if you just look at uh, like seance mediums and you know s spiritualists, so many are women, so many of them are people who are gay or or or, or sort of from an you know just outside you know the the mainstream in terms of lifestyle, sexuality, whatever. So many uh, of them. For the listeners, I'm again nodding vigorously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, the one really underrepresented group are straight white males, although they are there. Um, so I began to think about that in a weird way. I'm like, if, if it were a scam, straight white males would have dominated this field a <laughs> hundred years ago, <laughs> but they don't. And it's like, well, no, why is that? And I'm like, oh, because a straight white male embracing the, 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 the sort of liminal things actually reduces their status, but in almost every other group, it can raise your status. Interesting. Yeah. So, in the, you know, in the mid 1800s, a lot of women gained power by being spiritualists. Yeah. And a lot of, and there were probably also people who, you know, gay people who we still don't know were gay, were able to sort of trade upward in society in terms of notoriety or income or, or power in terms of people saying, Oh, I've been told I must talk to you. You have the, the, you know, the, the ear of, of the other side and I want to talk to you. And then, the, so their status comes up in a way that a lot of other areas outside of maybe art wouldn't allow. And I think maybe that's why we've, we've seen that. And it seems to be a recognizable aspect of a subset of the paranormal. Well, I agree. And I, I think there, and I think on the skeptical side, there's a lot of assumptions that people will do this sort of thing to seek status consciously. And I'm not so convinced that, that, that's necessarily even a conscious aspect, but it's certainly a result, you know, and it's like, as, it, as you gain status within a community, you may be aware that you're seeking it, but you may just be doing what you 
thing feels natural. And it just ends up that that makes you popular or, or powerful or, or grants you certain a- a- aspects to your life that you didn't have otherwise. But it certainly comes up, especially in the 19th and early 20th century, uh, you see it happen, uh, you know, it, it's an important reminder that we've only had uh, suffrage, uh, women's vote for less than a century. You know, I mean, it's yeah. it's, it's that struggle, well, you know, it's crazy. It, and so finding outlets to get power in the patriarchy is no small deal. That's a f- huge thing. Well, and it's such a it's such a sort of empty argument that, you know, well, people, you know, people claim uh, st- sort of jump on the supernatural train as a way to become famous and make money. And it's like, really? Okay. So I'll, I'll hold up a book that's right here that I'll be talking about in season three. <laughs> oh, that'll be fun. Yeah. Communion. I'm haunted by that cover. <laughs> as is America and the world. But um, now there's a straight white male whose status was really on the rise. Yeah. And then wrote wrote that book, some follow on books. Thirty years later, he, he is not Stephen King. Okay. That's right, right, yeah. He's been rejected but, from. We're not concerned about who's going to be keeping the Wolfen franchise alive, right? <laughs> right. You know, like in other words, if he had just kept, if he had just kept writing, yes, you're absolutely right. Novels, yeah, yeah. He would be a guy still in print. You know, yeah. with with a you know huge backlog, he'd have a house in Malibu and everything else. He does not, let me tell you, and and it was because he came out as a person who was having these experiences that other people have in the same way that he had, and and he just got you know rejected from oh, did, everything. Did, did we say what we're talking about? I know you held it up, but that was. Oh, commu- I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> we're talking about Whit- <laughs> Whitley Strieber in communion. Yeah. Communion. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're, we're, are, are there other people listening? Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was just us. <laughs> so yeah, he is not. Um, this is not a way of gaining status. I but guess and, is what I'm saying. And let's be honest, he had this huge hit with communion. He could have ridden that UFO gravy train. But then he brought it all to be about the dead and what happens after we die and all this consciousness no. stuff. And which I think he's being true to himself. But and, and I think uh, frequently he's mischaracterized by the skeptical community as being that gray alien guy. And I'm like, he is so much more and so much more complicated and not really well understood by the UFO community. Uh yeah, he's a he's a complicated yeah. character, and it certainly is not just riding the the money train. Yeah, no, and it was not obviously something he did as a stunt, right? You know, once I mean, it's basically been now the the majority of his life. This yeah. book came out almost Seems forty years. Extraordinarily ago. sincere about what he believes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 when the and of course he doesn't even like he doesn't even come out and say, look, I, here's what I believe. He is still struggling with these experiences. Yeah that he's still having. And the problem with this stuff is that, and it's all the supernatural stuff. I mean, it's, I'm going to say it's ghosts, it's UFOs, it's Bigfoot, it's everything. It, it all comes down to, and the reason it's, it's still impossible is that it, it comes down to this sort of physical, not physical. And we're still in a paradigm of physicality, which of course we should be and are, and that is where we live. But there are, if it, every aspect of the supernatural depends upon a notion of sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's not poltergeist. It's a ghost, but it moves stuff. Aliens, they're physical when they're interacting with me, but no one else sees them. And they walk through walls, which is a little weird. Yeah. yeah. They walk through walls and they seem to be able to, and, and it's sort of in my head, but it's also on my body. Yeah. There's no, there's no uh, analog for that. There's no, it's like, well, it's physical and not physical, like this other aspect of our life that we experience as physical and not physical. And I'm not talking about water. Yeah, water is physical and then you heat it up and it turns into steam, but steam is still physical and we can all see it. This is something else. And it's been talked about throughout human history, but we're not at a point where we can have a rational conversation about well, it's that thing that is sometimes physical and sometimes not. Yeah. 
Well, it is intriguing. I so I'm. I, we'll be. It'll be interesting to see what happens next week. I think on sometime next week, uh, I have a article coming out, and I say next week. This will be after Labor Day or around Labor Day. Mm-hmm. I have an article come out in the UK Skeptic Magazine, which is. It's about brain function and materialism and how beliefs work and how there's this concept of the mind virus uh, that comes from Richard Dawkins and memetics. But also, Dawkins also came out with virus of the mind as religion is a mind virus that can invade your brain. I'm like, "Mm, but can it? Is that really how ideas work? Do do you hear an idea and suddenly you believe it? Or, Or is it something more complicated? Because we don't really just hear an idea and suddenly it takes over our bodies. That's not really what happens. But that's the metaphor. And it's become so pervasive. People talk about the woke mind virus and all these other ideas about – like you can be infected by an idea – and it will just take over and you lose. Sorry, if you had a conscious will, if you had control of your life, you don't anymore because now you're subject to the mind virus. I'm like, no, that's not really what's happening. And it's a bad metaphor and it's a bad idea. And there's no, there's not like, if you want to be a materialist, you need to acknowledge that brains don't work like that. Right. So um, I'm probably going to get in trouble with some people. We'll see how it plays out. But yeah, I, uh, I, I basically accuse Richard Dawkins of magical thinking because it, that's really well, – that's not how brains work. That's not how – if you're going to be a materialist, you need to acknowledge that we – you know, yeah. we, we, that's just not how it works. I, I, I'm more eloquent in the article than what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> it's just wrong. Um, in the um, in the episode I do on Ted Sirios, I talk about that because we get into yeah Randy and and um and it's um it's funny how quickly how a a a materialist skeptic will will on the one hand kind of dismiss therapy and psychology and 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 much of that sort of soft science. And and poo poo it and 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 just you know hustle it right out of the room, um, until they need a metaphor, <laughs> you know, or until they need to explain something away, and then something is then it's like well it's the like it's, it's it's mass hysteria, it's a mind virus, it's crowd think, it's the it's the sort of personality that is highly susceptible to suggestion, right? Right. Yeah. It's right. Like, well, maybe that's real. I don't know. But wow, that's a pretty broad category, right? You know, to say but that if you're going to accept that, yeah. then then what you're doing is you along with that, you have to import a whole lot of soft scientific thinking. Yeah. If you you're going to if yeah. you're going to suddenly give a lot of credence to, you know, well, it's a kind of, you know, psychological mindset. It's like, oh, oh, I didn't know there were psychological mindsets. Yeah. I thought therapy was all bullshit and we were all kidding ourselves. So it's like. Every, everyone is kidding themselves and themselves uh, and him and herself in different ways. But um, – and, you know, it's funny. It's like there's some mornings I wake up and I'm just, you know, I'm I'm pissed off at skeptics. But I find less and less. And especially after I have conversations like this where it's just like, you know what? We're all getting old. We're all trying to figure this out. We're all just trying to get through and – and if if that's your way of getting through and you're not hurting anyone else, then then great, you know, and 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 really now I'm just like I'm just like, well, at least when I see skeptical conferences, I'm seeing more women. Yeah, and maybe I'm seeing <laughs> yes. a few people of color. There, there's some brown people. Yay. Yeah, it's like, like I, Tyson. I, yeah, I okay, whatever. Do, do you know? I mean, look, I, I am absolutely the i'm just absurdly liberal about my politics and my outlook on life i want everybody to thrive and it's the most embarrassing thing in the world to me that i only can think of maybe two or three uh people of color who are interested in cryptozoology it is that's ridiculous like <laughs> well, well because because it, it shit white club people do people out oh I, well, okay. So my my first episode of season two um, is uh, "Monsters Among Us" by Linda Godfrey. Okay, cool. And um, and great tie into our just... previous two episodes about Dogman. Mm. <laughs> uh, uh, oh yeah, oh, I saw that. Yeah, I haven't I haven't uh, caught up with. No that worries, yet. no worries. So yeah, <laughs> but it sort of talks about there's a, there's a portion of it that's sort of like, well, Linda got some grief for being a woman 
in in parapsychology in general, much less you know a a sort of fringy area of cryptozoology. You know, she wasn't even talking about Bigfoot. She was talking about, you know, werewolves. Dog, and dog man. man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and but it brings up the fact that 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 modern parapsychology, but really all parapsychology to a large extent has been a white boys club. I mean, how many of those ghost hunting shows do you see where there's people of color? Not many, except for the Ghost Brothers. But I mean, they're they're kind of the outlier, though. I mean, in that yeah. field, yeah. And now well, some of that. Once I started doing this, Susan yeah. was like, "Well, you are going to talk about some women authors," and I'm like, "Well, sure." And I started going through my books, going through my books, going through my books. Hang on, I'll find one. Going through the books. Oh, here's one. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh shit, I, this is this is not as. But 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 then again, I'm I'm looking at well, who is being published in the last 100 years in America? Okay, that doesn't mean there aren't women and people of color who weren't. I mean, there's probably like if you look at a book, if a book is published about you know famous mediums, it'll all be white people and mostly it'll be women. But what it's not accounting for is the you know the, the women or men from other cultures whose voices weren't even being asked for, but within yeah. their cultures were very well known. And they're probably just the person next door. Yeah. They're not getting famous. It's just like, okay, well, in this neighborhood, we happen to know that the person who lives three houses down can speak to the dead, you know, or can tell the future or can do whatever. Yeah. And, and we don't know those names and that's our fault. Yes, exactly. We never the, asked. The history doesn't necessarily reflect the real history, right? The full history. Yeah. Exactly. Even we, if it's just a cultural history. Exactly. Even if you don't yeah. even want to believe it, it's just a yeah. culture. We, we and, and I'm I'm hoping, and I'm like, you know, we've had the internet now for 25 years or something. I mean, can't we, shouldn't we be translating every single book? Aren't there like a million books written in Chinese about Chinese people and their abduction experiences? Yeah. Shouldn't we have that? And I'm using that as an example. Well, but, but I mean, no, but for any... you know, for our audience, is I'm trying to get out into monsters across cultures. Like I'm trying to get into Asia and Africa, and right, it's like it's harder because the English written literature about it is less, but it's still there. I mean, the the right. you know, the, the experiences are there, and they're important and should be discussed. Right, they should be known. You know, so well, you know, Scott and Forrest just did. Um... On Astonishing Legends, their podcast, which is how we met, they did an episode, I think a two-parter, on the elusive force um, about a young woman, I believe in in um, Hungary, who in the 80s was displaying, you know, there was poltergeist phenomenon, and then she was sort of doing macro PK. And, um, and, and it was extremely well documented, but... Literally, it was only like in the last five years that a book written about her was translated and she was largely unknown until fairly recently. And I'm like, but why? Why does it take 40 years, especially when you're talking about the last 40 years? Shouldn't we know all this stuff a lot quicker? And shouldn't there – it would be like if I had the money – all it would be is translations. Just yeah. Like, no, for what real. What languages do you speak? Go find those books. Go into that area. And with some of that stuff is starting to happen within American subcultures. But I'm still curious. What are the books being written in languages that are never published in English that should be? Yeah. You know, for, for the people who are interested. You know, my co-host Karen is a linguist. She would be losing her mind to miss out on this conversation at this point. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, Karen. I'm really I'm sorry. sorry about that. Sorry, Karen. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, you're right. And I, I, I you know, as a nerd, uh, I, I definitely am a big fan of open source software. And as a, a technology enthusiast, enthusiast I, I am, I'm really frustrated by both copyright and patent law in how it's been corrupted by capitalism to, to instead of keeping a small window for people to you know profit but then it becomes a big cultural thing it's like they keep extending the life of these these uh walls and i i feel the the direction is that they're just going to keep make this wall higher and f more difficult to cross but the technology is there to make all this stuff yeah. available, and and it should be because that's our heritage as human beings is to be able to it, tap into that 
that narrative space and and learn from every culture and it, yeah. the barriers of language are now more artificial than ever and and, and well, it's just, it, yeah it's just crazy and maybe that's the work of the next generation i hope um, so I, I hope somebody I breaks your, that wall down well you know i don't like i can speak from somewhat for my kids from my observation of them that they are you know they're in their 20s my youngest son is 17 not interested in money at all not not a, an ambitious cell in their body it just is not how they're motivated they want to have a good life they want to have their friends they want to be able to wake up in the morning and be creative and not starve and that's about it Same. there is no one gives a about brands or I, I want to drive this car, wear this suit, have this job, live in this. They couldn't give a shit. And I'm talking, and I find this to be very common. I also find that they are uh, empathetic and kind and socially aware. And when, when that's where you're coming from, you can do a whole lot of shit because you are not the, the culture and and the sort of the monetary system doesn't have a gun to your head. If you don't Thank care you. about money, yeah. you know, no, you, of course. They the will. Time, I I mean, want, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I want them all to have every kind of protection they can have and health care and yeah. union. And exactly. All that yeah. stuff. Um, it's not like, oh, they don't care about it. So they want to be, you know, wage slaves. But it's not how they're motivated and it's not how their brains work. And so maybe they're the ones who are like, well, we'll go find ways to communicate with people. I and hope we'll they use do. Yeah. technology to do all that. So I'm maybe a pathological optimist, from. Richard. I, I really am a pathological optimist. But my generation is full of cynicism and yeah. and and just pessimism. And, and, and it's like I, I hate it because I know so many people my age who don't see a future. And I've got kids and I'm like, these kids don't know that cynicism. That's not in their – they just don't know it. They don't understand right. it. And I want them to thrive and I want them to build a better future where we find ways to communicate and get along, not not the, I, so many things happen in the world right now, which are selfish and pessimistic and nationalistic and like that whole global idea, like the idea that we're all living on one planet. And we need to figure out ways to get along. Like clearly we could all thrive. We could all, but like that selfish tendency we end up with billionaires. I, I've come to believe there's no such thing as an ethical billionaire. You know, like it's just, that doesn't yeah. make any sense. It fucks you up. Yeah, yeah, it really does. Like getting that much accrued wealth is not good for you. And all people do when they get it is try to keep it. Fear and cynicism is not the way to a brighter future. It just well, isn't. Yeah. They all get to this point where the last frontier is just like, well, how do I become immortal? I mean, just, yeah. you know, <laughs> build me a tank and I'm going to live. If they're all, I mean, they're nuts yeah but but the thing is we you know our age group is always cynical when i was a kid the people i knew aunts and uncles and grown-ups and parents they were cynical too because everyone grows up thinking it's going to get solved in your lifetime and it's never going to get solved in your lifetime the fight goes on it was going on before you were here it's going to go on forever after we're all gone uh, and, and and but we get upset because we're like, oh, well, when, when I walked into this movie, I was told there'd be a satisfying conclusion. And now I'm beginning <laughs> to realize there, there will not be. <laughs> Indeed. But, when, but think about it. Like when we were kids, it was a all anyone talked about was there is a button and someone's going to press it. And 15 minutes later, everything on Earth is going to be dead. Yes, There's that was our later. that was the world we lived in for sure. Yeah. And now, how did our parents feel about us? You know, they were probably sitting there going, well, what's the point? You know, these these kids, they're not going to be alive. They're, there's not even going to be a world. Oh, you, the year 2000? That's never going to happen. I mean, for sure, I would feel that way. Yeah, I, I get my age. I, I, I grew up with apocalyptic uh, millennialists. They thought that the world was coming to an end. And I can only say they seem somewhat disappointed that it has. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> you want the end of the movie within your life. Yes, I'm a player character. I deserve to see the end of the story arc, right? <laughs> Exactly. So here we are. Richard, thank you for being so generous with your time. And My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. No worries. And I, again, I, I know you're much more open to these things being real than I am, but I f love talking to you because we both, we want to understand what the f*** going on. 
we, 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 we stand as a living example of reaching across. The That's chasm right. Of they're, they're, they're belief like, and skepticism. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I love it. And I wish, I wish there were more people like you. I wish there were more people like me. Uh, this, this is, uh, this is great. I really appreciate it. So, well, again, thank you for having me on. Um, I'm uh, I'm I'm loving my foray into the world of podcasting, and uh, and so uh, it, which which you and Scott and Forrest uh, have have helped me uh, learn about and get excited about. So uh, now uh, now I'm I'm joining the party. Well, I'm excited. When when does Susan two Susan two when does season two. <laughs> There was no Susan 2. Forget I said that. There will be no Susan 2. When does season 2 come out? When when can people (laughs) find season 2? Season 2 begins. Season, we'll start with this. Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf Season 1 is out. Yep. Episodes 1 through 10. You can listen on any platform you love, Spotify, Apple, or a million others. Um, And then season 2 of Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf premieres on september 30th fantastic that's really soon so catch up on the first 10 episodes you'll love them and there won't be much of a wait for the next season that's exciting i am so happy for you i i really i loved what you did with season one i can't wait to hear season two are you going to stick to the 10 episode format or is that 10 10 episodes a season or or have you thought about that yeah i am going to stick to uh 10 episodes um but uh i will tell anyone who's listening because if you are listening and uh and you want to find out on labor day weekend uh check my feed there's going to be announcements awesome about um big stuff uh coming up for the show and um new ways to enjoy it uh so and and a couple really interesting things uh in terms of news so Come check my feed, jump on the feed, listen to the episodes that are there, and then Labor Day weekend, probably on the Monday, there will be a new short announcement episode where we'll talk about season two and other fun stuff coming up. Monster Talk. You've been listening to Monster Talk, the science show about monsters. I'm Blake Smith. And I'm Karen Stolzner. You just heard part two of my interview with screenwriter Richard Haddam about his new show, Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf. Check our show notes for a link to that and check your streaming services for Richard's writing in movies such as The Mothman Prophecies and in series like Miracles and Titans. Monster Talk's theme music is by Peach Stealing Monkeys. We hope you had a safe Labor Day weekend if you're here in America or just a safe regular weekend if you're not. Monster House presentation.